Welcome back to the Keep Going Podcast with Vin Kennedy. I'm your host, Vin Kennedy. As you can tell, another solo episode. We're back. We are, we're back to a solo. I don't think anybody wants it, but we're doing it, so here we are. So, I kind of want to touch on the marathon, um, what the process was like from the first marathon to the second, and then just kind of like an overall of this marathon. I'm also going to do an episode with my sister. Um, it was her first marathon, and kind of just break that down, try and help new runners, kind of learn from her experience, and give her a chance to like, speak about the prep and everything that went into that marathon before the race um a buddy of mine pat actually said something that was really really cool and i definitely wanted to to just post about it in any capacity um he said something i tell everyone is you're about to suffer it's just time it will end remember to smile and i just think that's so cool like you are going through you're putting yourself through a hard thing and it's gonna suck that's expected you're running 26 miles it's it's not all going to be fun and you know that but you know it will end and have fun in the process and it's this is how we get better this is how we evolve this is how we push ourselves and it was it was just so cool to hear that um again i want to reiterate it and he said um it's just something i tell everyone you're about to suffer it's just time it will end remember to smile and i kind of just played those words over my head uh, during the race, before the race, and I, I love that. I love that statement. I don't know if he came up with it. I think he did, and he's he does Ironmans. I met him actually at, a, at an ultra race. He was running 100 miles. He completed it. Just a savage of a human being, but just really, really cool words to live by, and I love that he said that. Another saying that I saw pre-race was, legs feed the wolf. I'm pretty sure this is from a quote from the movie Miracle, but it's legs feed the wolf. You need strong legs. You need a strong foundation to go out and hunt to provide for yourself and I obviously it's true in marathons you need strong legs to get through to push through but also in life you need a strong foundation to to get you to what you need and what you want and need and want being obviously the wolf needs to eat so he needs to be able to hunt he needs to be strong to do so and you in life you need a strong mental a strong body to kind of formulate what you want out of your life um, so that was that was just another really cool thing that I kept kept seeing, kept circulating. And a couple of days leading up prior to the race, something I was thinking of is, you know, you, you're trying to map out when you're going to push it, when you're going to take it easy. So you got to you got to know the course. Um, and I will get into that with the race. But something that it just popped in my head was I have an electric car, I have a Tesla. And I was thinking of how I'm, I'm always like conscious of conserving battery. You charge at your house. It, 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 they say it costs like an extra load of laundry a week. But, you know, and you get, I think I get 280 miles for a full charge. But I sit there and I, I'm always conscious of like, oh, I don't need the heated seat all the way up. Oh, I don't need the AC, the AC blasting. I don't need the heat blasting. I don't need the heated steering wheel on. And I'm always trying to conserve, conserve, and conserve. And obviously, when it comes to racing and, and life, I think this applies where it's like, if you're always conserving the battery, what are you conserving it for? So in the race, for example, that last 10K or whenever you can, um, and, and you strategically map it out, you should push it. You should put your foot to the gas and just give maximum effort or at least close to maximum effort and give what you could. Um, and I think the same with, with my Tesla. It's like, you know, if if it's a really cold day, bless the, bless the heat. Who cares? Like, you're going to go home and charge it anyway. And I, I think that's just something I'm going to apply more to in my life. Um, and then just even in life as a whole, I feel like, we're always putting things off and always, you know, when I get that, then I'll enjoy this. Or, you know, when I get the dream physique or when I make X amount of dollars or, you know, I want this in my savings until I do that. Or I want, you know, I have a, I have a big Italy trip coming up in September with my mom. And, you know, I've been sitting here and I'm like, I could definitely make it work, but is it the best idea? And I'm like, well, what if I'm not here next year to make Italy happen? So it's like, don't always conserve the battery and forget to live your life. Lastly, and then we'll just dive into the marathon, is uh, if you think marathons or racing is about beating anyone other than the person in the mirror, you're already lost. Um, marathons are about beating personal PRs, about beating the clock. You're racing nothing but the clock in any race. Um, I don't care if it's 100 miles. I don't care if it's a 5K. The person next to you is not your competition. And, you know, it's easy to get caught up when you're running and you, you, you're close to people but use it as a push you're not you know if you pass someone you see them gas out like i i try and say encouraging words this race i didn't get 
a lot of chances to speak to many people. Um, I had a couple conversations, but I was kind of just just pushing it and, and trying to really stay in my zone. And uh, but but just in the past, I know like even running on the boardwalk, and you have no idea what mileage people are at or how far they're running that day. And it's just there's no reason not to be supportive because everyone just like in life is running their own race and on their own path. For those of you that don't know, I went to the Mesa Arizona Marathon and this was my second, I consider it second real marathon. Third marathon is a total. Uh, my first marathon I ran in 2020 with basically no training. I would just push it mileage wise to whatever I can. I'd run 16 miles, wouldn't run for a couple days because I'd be sore. I'd run 13 miles, wouldn't run for a couple days because I'd be sore, run 17 miles. And then I was like, F it. Um, I don't know why I said F it because I curse all the time. Fuck it. Um, I'm just going to run a marathon. So I did. And destroyed my body. Destroyed myself. Uh, I think it took like four hours and 30 minutes, which is, for me personally, skill-wise, is very slow. And that was in 2020. Then I, most people know, I took uh, took my talents to Boulder, Colorado, which probably wasn't the smartest thing. But I wanted to run a marathon and do a bodybuilding show in the same year. Um, I knew I could run the marathon. I was just like, all right, how can I make this harder? I was like, hey, let's throw some altitude in there. Obviously, I trained in New Jersey, so to run in Colorado was a big task. Um, so that marathon had hills. I ran a 323, which damn proud of for really my first real marathon, one marathon prep in me. I think I prepped for five months, I want to say. Um, 500 miles, 600 miles total for the prep. It was a really, really, really good prep. Um, I think I rolled my ankle once, but anyway. So that takes us to fast forward 16 weeks from that. And we are at Mass Arizona. And from what I was told, what I looked at, flat course, great temperatures, and it's, it's a PR course. And that's why people run it. Um, and that's why, we, uh, that's why we selected it. I wanted to see kind of what I could do. Now, the prep as a whole didn't really go as planned. I got injured multiple times. I wasn't really healthy after Thanksgiving. I really just wasn't healthy on, I would say, 80% of my runs, which is not ideal. But, you know, I wasn't, it was nothing crazy that I wasn't going to be able to push through. Um, rolled a few ankles, had an IT issue. The IT issue led to, you know, sometimes it feels like knee pain. From there, I was compensating. So I had a, uh, behind the knee issue on my other leg. Um, and yeah, that was, it was kind of just injury plagued. So I, I was kind of just pushing through all the prep. So didn't go as planned, but obviously got it done. And I was excited race day, felt good race day. Um, no real pains, just, you know, I, I wouldn't say I even felt tight. I just, you know, things were on hundred percent still, but it is what it is. Had a good taper um, and definitely just wanted to run my best. And I did, I don't think, so no injuries actually held me back. Um, obviously they held me back through the prep, but as far as race day, I was, I was good. It's funny because I think a lot of things are foreshadowed in our lives and this is a little vulgar, but, um, there were two runs where my stomach was just, my stomach was just not cooperating with me. Um, and it's, it's funny, but basically there were two runs that I could think of that my stomach was just not not working with me. There was a six mile run after a wedding one Saturday night. I shouldn't have left the run till after the wedding, but I did. I was eating very, very clean. Uh, went to the wedding, had potatoes. They were cooked in some sort of oil and spices or whatever, sauce, whatever, and they destroyed my stomach. So with that being said, after the wedding, I knew I had to get my miles done. So went and got my miles done. And I would say right before the end of the mileage or of the run, my stomach was just exploding. And not to be vulgar, but I had to utilize a bathroom, which was not anywhere to be found. So I uh, I pooped outside. And this is common among runners. I've never done it myself un until this moment. But yeah, so that happened. And then I ran a 20 mile run. And while you run these long runs, you fuel. So you use like goo packs, you use like gels, um, something did not agree with my stomach on a 20 mile long run same thing happened this was daylight so obviously wasn't fun but foreshadowing so pre-race for messes arizona i uh you know we got to the starting line 
we had about 10 minutes. The bathroom line was taking forever. It was cold out. We were next to a heater. I was trying to wait on bathroom line. It just wasn't going to work out. And uh, I pooped outside. I pooped outside next to a cactus. So that was pre-race. And now I have like two minutes to get to the starting line and then start the race. Now, I was all out of sorts because we were kind of a little late to begin with. Um, they said the drop off was, I believe it was 430. You had to be there. We got there at like 434. Didn't matter. But still, you know, you're just not on time. You're not, you know, everything's not perfect. And you, you kind of just a little pre, uh, pre-race pre jitters anyway. So that added to it. Um, and yeah, basically the thing with these races though, if you're chipped generally, so your bib will have a chip on it. So every you hit checkpoints that kind of update, you know, anybody watching and then specifically your times and your splits. So if you don't start when the gun goes off, it's not a big deal. I knew that, but I still just wanted to start when the gun went off. Um, and I, I did. And they had fireworks go off at the start. It was awesome. Um, but yeah, that, that happened. So my fueling plan for the race was what I generally do on all of my long runs. Um, anything over 18 really is when I start to do it is I try and utilize a gel pack every four miles. I always take my Nathan handheld water bottle. I usually do a scoop of G1M Sport or a form of electrolytes, which I think I had LMNT that morning. Uh, Pre-race, I salt loaded, carb loaded, so ate a little more carbs than I'm used to. Uh, took out a little bit of protein to supplement for the carbs. I didn't want to overeat that day, um, though I did eat a little more than I generally would. Um, same with salt. Uh, I was actually directed by a buddy to take 200 milligrams of salt in the morning, uh, I think 90 minutes before the race. And then I had a thousand milligrams of salt or did my best to get a thousand milligrams of salt every hour. Um, and yeah, and then it was goo packs every four miles and I use spring energy gels, but I also use the goo packs provided because they had caffeine and I took one of them cause I had one of them with me personally already. And then took one of them from the um, from the volunteers handing them out, and the caffeine just really was kind of rubbing my. It really helped, and it was kind of giving me a little extra boost that I needed. So I started taking those rather than my own goo packs. Hydration, I would say. So basically, mile one, one to three, you just had to pick your legs up. You were falling downhill. It was great. Um, felt awesome. I knew personally I needed to kind of maintain myself and not get um too ahead of myself so the beginning miles obviously could have went quicker but i knew hey let me pull back a little bit the plan was to run a 313 right around there so i believe it was like a 725 pace for the whole marathon so the initial plan was taper back try and run like a 725 for the first half marathon um and then you know push where you can you really I really only wanted to push it the last 6k which would be or the last 10k which would be six miles I knew that four to six was uphill everything else was either flat or downhill it was downhill last couple miles to end it straight downhill to start it um and the plan with the hills was just even energy level don't even worry about pace so if you fall to like a 735 you know 10 seconds slower on the hills just kind of go with it and and figure it out and that's kind of what i did so the one issue i ran into was mile one i realized i didn't have my because of the whole being late having to go to the bathroom outside um you when you have your drop bag so you have everything that you have with you you do a drop bag basically anything that you want at the starting line or at the end of the race just say you took a sweatshirt you're not going to run with it you take it off put it in the bag that'll get brought to the finish line so I left my salt in the bag on accident because it was just, again, a little flustered, a lot going on. Um, so I realized mile one. So right off the bat, I knew either, hey, you have to talk to someone and ask for salt or um, I texted my mom while running and I was like, hey, can you meet me anywhere, pref preferably mile eight, because I knew I wanted the salt at least like 10 or 13. I knew I needed salt again when I hit like around the hour mark, but I didn't want to get to that point. Um, so, you know, obviously problems are going to arise during these races. So I knew they had Gatorade, uh, Gatorade electrolytes. So I knew obviously it had some form of salt, some form of salt and electrolytes in it. So I was like, all right, every aid station, I'm just going to chug Gatorade until I could get salt 
and then I'll kind of just try and use that if I can. Luckily, was able to meet my mom at mile 13, um, but the races are complicated, it's hard. So I was texting her, hey, can you meet me at mile eight? And she's like, I have no idea how to get there. She went to the 13th for the half marathon, which the 13th for the half marathon is 26 mile. So that didn't work out. Um, so basically, luckily she found the 13th for my mar for the full marathon, um, met her there. She gave me two salts. I gave her my handheld because I was done with it. That was kind of an easy, smooth transition. So that worked out. But again, these are all things that you don't want to have to deal with, but of course they're going to arise um, on race day. Things just happen. So yeah, so to backtrack a little bit, basically one through three, falling downhill, um, even paces. I think it was a lot of like seven, seven, 13, seven, 15s. Um, I definitely felt the, the hill when we hit the hill at, I believe it was mile four to six was a little bit of a climb and you felt it. you saw, you saw the, the grade go up and it was, I want to say the slowest mile I ran was in the seven forties, which pretty happy about. And it was one of those things where I kind of just, it was one of those races where obviously the salt was, um, on my mind. Um, but everything else was pretty smooth. I felt fine. I felt good. Um, I kind of looked up and it was mile 16 before I knew it, which was cool. Um, a really, really big difference for me that I knew obviously from my last race to this race was I knew I needed the salt. So that was kind of heavy on my mind. But a second thing I did was my headphones died in my first marathon. So I actually invested in separate headphones called Jaybirds and the battery life is like, I don't even know how long, but they last the whole time. That's great. I personally listen to music or podcasts on runs, though. I don't even really listen to it. It kind of just like, I kind of like that, that background noise. So I, I felt good. I kind of looked up and I feel like I was at like 16, 18 and I was good. I saw my coach at mile four, mile 10. Um, and I believe again at like 16 and just checking in. How you feeling? Good. I tossed him actually my quarter zip. Um, and yeah, it was just, felt good i was on pace to go sub 313 from from what i knew and and i was excited the great thing with this course is it's downhill and flat often so one to three downhill three uh four to six uphill but everything else is flat and then the ending is downhill again now the issue with downhills is that you'll feel it more i personally think you'll feel it more on your body so my low back my quads and my, uh, my shins were starting to feel it a little bit. Um, I just felt my low back getting tight and I knew, I assumed it was just from all the, you know, you're kind of slamming going downhill, but yeah, outside of that, like it was just normal soreness, normal tightness, but I didn't run a crazy amount of mileage downhill. So I was definitely feeling it. Um, but again, I just broke the race into pieces. Um, and it kind of worked out for me. I, I feel like I was kind of just focused on getting to 20 because I knew that last 10K, I was really going to try and push it. And I, I looked up, like I said, it was kind of like that 18, 18, 16, 18 mark. And I was like, okay, I feel good. Like, obviously I'm feeling it. I know the race, the race really starts at 18 or 20. It's just kind of how it goes. And looking back at my splits, um, I pushed it at 19. I just, I didn't want to guess out. So I pushed it at 19, I ran like a, a low seven minute mile. And then I pushed it again at, at 26 and the last 0.37 of the race, I ran a 652, which again, I probably could have pushed it a little harder. The, but the big thing that I realized in this race is that I wasn't running, I was racing. So in Colorado, I was just running. I was running for dear life and just kind of holding on, really. I was just kind of hanging on, trying to get to the finish line. This one, I was I raced, I had a plan. I was executing the plan and it felt good. Um, I didn't want to guess out too soon. I probably, obviously you could always run a little faster. I definitely could have ran a little faster. I pushed it where I felt I could. I kind of pulled back when I felt I could, when I felt I needed it. Um, one thing I was monitoring was my heart rate. My heart rate was fairly low for a majority of the race. I think I averaged like a 158 heart rate, which now looking back, now I know the next one I could push a little harder because I was able to maintain that. I had another fast mile around mile like seven. I think I ran like a 657, which are just good indications that like you could push a little harder. Obviously, I'd, I'd rather not do it that early, but I, I'm assuming it was somewhat downhill or flat. 
and I was feeling good. So yeah, I was really happy about that. Um, I ran a 3.11.58, so three minute, uh, three hour, three minutes, three hour and 11 minute uh, marathon, just sub uh, 3.12. The goal, as per my coach, was a 3.13, so obviously hit that. Personally, I wanted to run under a sub 3.10. There is something, I just don't know if my watch registers as well as my Garmin did. I now wear Koros, but it, I feel like pace-wise, it kind of just gets thrown off. Like sometimes it would say I was at like a seven even, and then I would talk to the guy next to me, and he was like, "Yeah, no, we were at like a seven ten or seven fifteen. And I was like, "Oh, that's weird." But again, I didn't want to. I just didn't want to go, you know, foot on the gas and burn out. I've done that on long runs, and something else that I've noticed, even on my long runs, is. You know, sometimes your watch, you can't live and die by the watches, obviously, but sometimes your watch will say, or my watch would say on my long runs, you know, I was at like a, I needed a, under a 720 and I'm at like a 735. So then you start sprinting and your watch doesn't adjust right away. And you're looking down and it's still saying like a seven, now you're at a 720, but then you look down again and it's like, you're at a 645. And then now you just, can, now you just put all that out and you, you can't kind of, tame it back and kind of you lose your energy basically because you're exhausting yourself for these short spurts and it's just something to be weary of um especially when you're pacing for a race or a long run kind of gradually go down is what i've learned personally because if you make the quick like sprint and then your watch doesn't catch up and just say you hold that sprint for 15 seconds you know 15 seconds you're running 645 you don't need that time at all so you know it's just something to be cautious of and something I, I catch often on my runs you're not racing anybody but yourself but they have this statistics so I'd like to kind of just read them out um, out of there were 2,283 racers total in the marathon I was 224 so again it doesn't matter but these are just the stats I was 24th in my age group and my I was 24th in my age group for men so I thought that one was pretty cool I don't know how many men it was total, but just a cool stat. Yeah, just overall, I thought it was a great race. I loved um, Arizona as a whole. The temperature was great. It definitely started getting hot towards the end. I think the initial temperature was like 45 degrees, but as you obviously progressed, the sun came up, it got hotter. I think it ended at, for me, I would say around like 57 degrees, but it got hot that day. I think it ended at like 68. I was really proud because I, like I said, I raced this race. I did not run this race. This was a good confidence builder, um, not the best prep. I think my next marathon is going to be in the fall, probably like November-ish. So I think that's a good one that we could hit the ultimate goal of this, which has been sub three. Um, you know, obviously I'd like to run under three hours for a marathon qualify for Boston and uh, yeah I think November we have a good shot at doing that I have a couple races in the works to kind of get me to that goal um, something I think I personally just need is volume I think the speed is there it's just the having the base to kind of to kind of be able to sit at that speed for a long duration just to kind of map out my 2023 races in April I have the the end of April I have the Brooklyn half which I'm most likely going to shoot for a sub 130, which would be a really good confidence boost, a really good tell of, hey, you could hang on to the sub three pace for half the race. So it's just a good a good starting point to kind of get to that end goal of sub three. After that, in middle of May, I'll be heading out to the Grand Canyon with a buddy of mine. We're going to run the rim to rim to rim. Um, it's about 50 miles. You're basically just running and hiking the Grand Canyon. I'm not sure if we have a specific time frame on that as far as like time to finish in, but it's just going to be an awesome experience. And then August 5th, I have the Loopy Looper, which is a 100 mile race. I think it's just under four miles. You just keep running that loop. Um, it's like 27 laps of it. And yeah, I think it, the ending mileage is like 101, but I'm really, really excited to do my first ultra. Um, yeah. That's basically gonna wrap out 2023. And something my coach said, Jeff Cunningham, that I uh, that I enjoyed after the race is, there's three things we don't do. We don't drink warm beer, we don't drink bad coffee, and we don't run bad courses. Meaning, you know, my first course that I chose to run at was Boulder, Colorado, which was hilly and obviously had altitude. 
And uh, yeah, you don't do that. You run, you run a Mesa, Mesa, Arizona. It's a great, great race, awesome environment, and the temperature and the course is absolutely perfect. But yeah, that's all I got. Basically, I'm gonna do another recap with my sister, kind of get her perspective. I'll talk about the conversations I had during the race. Um, but I kind of wanted to do my own breakdown of it. And thank you guys for listening. Appreciate it.